Hello, and welcome to this video on the pathophysiology of pulmonary arterial hypertension from the Atrium Cardiology Collaborative at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. My name is Brent Reed, and I'm an assistant professor at the school and a member of the team who takes care of patients with pulmonary hypertension at the University of Maryland Medical Center. To begin, pulmonary hypertension, or PH, is a clinical syndrome characterized by narrowing of the pulmonary arteries. If left untreated, the increased pressure that often results can produce enlargement of the right ventricle and, in many cases, right ventricular failure. The World Health Organization, or WHO, categorizes pulmonary hypertension into five groups, all of which are characterized by an elevation in mean pulmonary artery pressure. However, the underlying pathophysiology for each of these groups is a little bit different. First, group 1 patients are those with pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, which will be the focus of this video. Group 2 is the largest category and represents those who have pulmonary hypertension as a result of left heart disease and the increase in pulmonary pressure that often results from volume overload. Group 3 are those with pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung diseases, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and Group 4 represents those with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or CTEF. Group 5 is a category that represents miscellaneous etiologies, or those where a single cause is difficult to determine. Several processes are implicated in the pathophysiology of PAH, as illustrated in this example pulmonary arteriole. An imbalance of physiologic vasoconstrictors and vasodilators leads to net vasoconstriction of the pulmonary smooth muscle. We'll return to this concept in a few moments when we review the disease-modifying therapies. Additionally, inflammatory mediators such as leukocytes and other components of the immune system are also often involved. Platelet aggregation and thrombosis may occur as a consequence of alterations in physiologic blood flow or due to the imbalances in normal coagulation pathways. Finally, over the long term, these insults can cause pathologic changes to the structure of the vascular smooth muscle, a process often referred to as remodeling. A number of disease-modifying therapies have been developed to reverse the pulmonary vasoconstriction that occurs in PAH. These therapies work on one of three major pathways. The first we'll discuss is the endothelin pathway. Patients with PAH have excess circulating concentrations of endothelin-1, which leads to vasoconstriction and smooth muscle proliferation. Endothelin receptor antagonists, such as bocentan, inhibit endothelin receptors to prevent this process. In the second pathway, nitric oxide acts as one of the body's physiologic vasodilators, and it also has antiproliferative effects. It acts via increased cyclic GMP concentrations. Exogenous nitric oxide may be administered to enhance this pathway, but this is primarily reserved for acutely ill patients. The guanylate cyclase stimulator, Riosigwat, may also be used to increase cyclic GMP production to enhance this pathway. Finally, cyclic GMP is broken down by phosphodiesterase type 5, so PDE5 inhibitors such as sildenafil can be used to prevent cyclic GMP degradation. Lastly, the prostacyclin pathway involves the production of prostacyclin, another endogenous vasodilator and antiproliferative that exerts its activity via enhanced cyclic AMP concentrations. Prosinoids, such as epiprosinol or triprosinol, may be used to augment this pathway in patients with PAH. That concludes today's video on the pathophysiology of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Be sure to check out our other videos on YouTube, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at AtriumRx. Thanks for stopping by.